Hello everybody and welcome to module 14 and now we're getting into a new topic called simple linear regression. I do regret this term simple. I know the first time students see it, it's far from simple. But there's a lot of different regression techniques that exist and this is the simplest. Now, what this allows us to do is estimate the relationship between two variables. So you're going to be working with uh, a variable called y. This is your dependent variable. And we say y is somehow dependent on x, which is my independent variable. But it's not a perfect relationship. So here what we can see is, of course, this is describing a linear relationship, that y is somehow a linear function of x. This term here, this is what we call an error term. And this is some random variable where we say y, or sorry, epsilon is normally distributed with some mean zero and some standard deviation whatever that population standard deviation is, for now, it does not matter. What does matter here is that it has, in fact, a mean of zero. And you'll talk about that more in class as one of the assumptions that has to work, that has to hold for this methodology to work. So what I've shown you here, this is called the regression model. And then we look at what is called the regression equation, and the regression, let me just finish this up, that's the regression model. The regression equation is then when we take the expected value and that gives us now a pure linear relationship. The expected value of y is a linear function of x. So you can see here the error term has disappeared and that's because that error term has a mean of zero. So when we take the expected value, it's gone. I don't have to worry about it. And this is what we estimate. So then we have the estimated regression equation. And that takes the form y hat b0, b1, x1. So these terms b0 and b1, those are your sample parameters, your sample estimates of the population values beta 0 and beta 1. So as you've gone through these last few, well, quite a few modules, of course, you've come across x bar as being a point estimate of mu, and you've come across s as being a point estimate of sigma, or s squared as an estimate of sigma squared. You've come across p bar as a point estimate of p, some unknown population proportion. And, you know, we're just adding to this list. So now we have uh, y hat is a point estimate of the expected value of y. B0 is that point estimate of beta 0, the intercept. B1, point estimate of beta 1, etc. So again, we're drawing samples, we're using information contained in those samples to, to estimate the corresponding population coefficients. Now, in regression analysis, there's a few things that we can do with it. One of them is that we can use it for prediction, meaning once I have my values for B0 and B1. So let's say this is, you know, 10 plus 3x. Well, now I can use this for prediction. So you give me or somebody gives me some value of interest, call it x star, give me some value, 5. What does y equal if x equals 5? Or what is my best guess of y when x equals 5. So you can use it for prediction. Now, if you're given a value for the independent variable, I can now predict some value for the dependent variable. Similarly, we can also use this for an understanding of the nature of the relationship between x and y. And that is described by that coefficient, that slope coefficient. This slope coefficient is what we call an estimate of the marginal effect. 
So if x changes by one unit, whatever those units are, if x changes by one unit, that point estimate, that b1, in my example, that number three, that tells me the marginal effect. What is the incremental effect of a one unit change in x? How is that going to affect y? So here I have if x increases by one unit, my estimate of y increases by three units, whatever that is. And of course, as we go through some examples, you'll, you'll get a better understanding of this because we'll have some more context. Now, what I want to do here briefly is to, to connect what we're doing, what you are going to be doing, in module 14 with some of those things that you are probably already fairly comfortable with and fairly familiar with. So if we think back, if we think back to, to module nine or even earlier, when you first understood what a, a mean was and what a point estimate of that mean was, if I take a, a population an entire population of data. And let's assume, as we must for our regression analysis, that our population is normally distributed and has some population standard deviation, but the, the values here don't matter. So here's what that normal distribution would look like. Now, I'm just gonna kind of flip this around a little bit I'm going to rotate it, use your imagination, and I'm going to rotate this so that I can draw it vertically. And now here I have that population mean mu, whatever it is. Now we understand how those observations are distributed. Right here I have a high frequency of observations close to the mean on either side. And as we move further out, from that population mean, the frequency of those observations diminishes. There's fewer and fewer observations further and further out from the mean. So I, I can draw this as, as a scatter plot, something maybe like this, right? I've got a, a thick density of observations close to that mean, but as we get further and further out, they get more sparse. There's fewer of them. Okay, so here's a different way of thinking, of visualizing that population. So I can also describe this with a fairly simple equation because here I can see, or I can say, that every one of the observations, so if I take, let's just take some observation here, yi, any observation, yi, can be described by the following equation. It can be equal to the mean plus some deviation from that mean. That deviation is either a positive deviation, as is the case for the yi that I've selected here, or if I take some other observation, it could be a, a negative deviation from that population mean. And of course, this epsilon, well, it is normally distributed, it has a mean of zero, and it has some population standard deviation sigma. So of course, if I take the expected value of that, well, that epsilon disappears, and my average value is equal to mu, the population mean. Now, what happens, of course, when we estimate that? I wanna estimate that population mean. Well, then I take a sample, right? So then I don't have all of these observations. Let me get a little smaller here. So I don't have all of these observations. I've only got a subset of that population. And now I calculate a sample. And here's that sample, maybe somewhere here, right? Our sample is our sample mean is never exactly equal to the population mean. It, it deviates, and of course we understand the distribution of uh, those sample means. So that means here, let me just give myself a little bit of space. 
that that predicted value here is equal to x bar, right? So I'm, I'm mixing some of the notation that we talk about in regression analysis, that y hat, which is our predicted value, with certainly some notation that you're quite familiar with, x bar. So here we're taking something that you know, you've talked about, you've looked at probably for weeks or months now, understanding how observations within a population are distributed. Every observation can be described as some deviation from the mean. The expected value, of course, of that population is the population mean mu. And then when we want to estimate that, well, we reach into that population, we take a sample, and we calculate x bar. And x bar is my best point estimate of the unknown population mean mu. Now, thinking back here in terms of regression, when I talked about our different uses for regression, one of those was to understand the nature of the relationship between our two variables. Well, Currently, I only have one variable, so there's no relationship here to discuss. But the other use is to think about this in terms of, uh, of, of prediction, of predicting some unknown value. So an example that I often use in class is, you know, to, to think about a, a grade distribution, a grade distribution for a, a statistics course. And to think about this in terms of, you know, how can I use this for prediction? Well, we think, you know, imagine that I, I, as the instructor, I get a phone call from a student and, or I don't even know if it's a student for that matter, I just get a phone call. And on the other end of that phone, the, there's a voice, it's scrambled. I don't know, I don't know who it is. I don't know anything. I don't have any information about who's on the other line, on the other end of the phone. And they say, Peter, what is my grade in stats two? I don't know, I've, I've got no information uh, about you. I don't know anything. My best guess is to say, well, you know, the average in that course is, uh, I don't know, 75%. So that's, that's it, that's my best guess. Now, what is the chance of being correct? Well, the chance of being correct is absolutely zero. But certainly, I've made a mistake. And the magnitude of that mis mistake, well, if, again, if I take any observation of yi, the magnitude of that mistake, it could be quite large. It could be fairly small, but it, it could be anything. So how might I want to improve upon that ability to predict? Well, if I want to improve on that ability to predict, I need more information. I need more information that is somehow related to the grade because if I have some other piece of information that is related to the grade, well then I can use that information to better predict that corresponding grade. So what if I then say, you know, I have reason to believe that student performance, let me just clean this up a little bit here, that student performance is related to how much time they spend studying. Okay, well, you know, that seems like it's probably valid. There's probably a relationship there. So that takes this model and now it expands it. Instead of just being you know, one variable, well, now I'm saying that value is somehow related to this other piece of information. And so we go through this same kind of derivation from our model to our regression equation and to our estimated regression equation where we estimate b0 and b1. And so what this means now is that I have this added piece of information which graphically comes across as another dimension, right? I go from just that one dimension, that just that black line, that y-axis, to now I have this second 
axis. Now I have the x-axis. So now I'm going to move that x down here. Oops. This now is my average on the y-axis. So I'm going to call this that y-bar. That's my average grade 75%. Down here now is my x-axis. And here this is the number of hours of studying. And so all of these data points, and again, I'm not changing any of the data points. All we're saying is that now I have a little bit more information about each of those observations. So now instead of only having information about grade, well, now I also know for each of those students, I also know how many hours they spent studying. So, what does that do? Well, it just takes all of those dots that I had and now stretches them out along that x-axis. It doesn't change the fact that the average grade is still 75%. Certainly that doesn't change. But now I have, and here I'm assuming, I think it's a, an appropriate assumption, a positive relationship, that as students study more, that average grade tends to increase. And so now I'm just spreading these out over that additional piece of information. And this now gives that positive relationship where now I have that B0, I have some slope B1, and this is described now by that estimated regression equation. So once more, if I take some representative observation, and then say I take this one here, here's my yi. So if I get that phone call, that anonymous random phone call, and Peter, what is my grade in the course? And I guess the average, 75%. Well, this is a representation of the magnitude of that error, right? That difference, and this is hopefully going to start to look familiar, that difference between a, a value, one of my observations, and that sample mean, y bar. Well, if I square that and add those up across all of my observations, what does that start to resemble? Well, this is SST a measure of the total variation that exists in my sample. But now I have this additional piece of information. Now I say, okay, listen, you, whoever you are on the other line, on the other end of the phone, tell me, how many hours a week do you tend to study? And they'll say, oh, I study, uh, I don't know, six hours a week. So there's that value of interest, right, that I talked about earlier. Give me some value of interest in my independent variable. And now I can put that into my estimated regression equation. And that gives me my predicted value y hat. So let's say that that's 80%. So here's this y hat value. Well, that is my point estimate of the average grade for those students who study six hours a week. So for students who study six hours a week, the average grade is 80%. So now that's my guess. I'm not guessing 75% anymore, now I'm guessing 80%. So what does that mean? Am I correct? No. But my error is reduced, right? I have improved my estimate by this amount. I have improved my estimate by the difference between that predicted value and that average value. And again, if I square those and add those up across all of my observations, this is what we call sum of squares due to regression. This is a measure of how much of the variation in my data set, in my dependent variable, how much of that variation have I captured or have I explained by incorporating this additional information, in this example, number of hours spent studying. I've improved it by some amount. 
Am I correct? No, I'm not correct. There's still certainly some random error. And so, of course, this difference here between my observed value and my predicted value, that difference between my observed value and my predicted value, well, that, of course, is our sum of squares due to error. So you can see there's some ANOVA creeping in here, right? Similar to what we looked at in module 13. So this is a very brief rundown. Then we'll get into, once we go through getting an understanding of how to estimate these linear relationships, then we'll get into discussions on testing for statistical significance. In other words, does this relationship even exist? Do I have evidence to show that this is different from zero? Right, there's our null and alternative hypotheses. Because maybe that relationship doesn't even exist. Maybe we'll go through, we'll estimate some value B1, and then we can do a test on it, and this is just a very simple t-test, to see if we have evidence to show that that estimate is statistically different from zero. Because if I cannot distinguish it from zero, well then that means that the relationship doesn't exist. So certainly there'll be some hypothesis testing that comes into this, but you can see we're going to be doing a lot more stuff first. The hypothesis testing is going to come later. Just like all of these other things that we've estimated, all of these point estimates, well for anything that we've had a point estimate, what else have we had? Well we've had interval estimates as well. And so here just as we've had these interval estimates around x bar, and we've had interval estimates around s and proportions, well, here we're going to have, actually for that one, we're going to have two. We're going to have something called a confidence interval, sounds familiar, and something else called a prediction interval. And we'll do confidence intervals here for the slope. We can produce intervals for that intercept, but we are going to focus our discussion here on how to interpret and how to perform analysis with that slope. Because the slope is really what describes that relationship between your two variables. So this gives you a pretty good rundown, pretty good introduction to linear regression. Module 14 is an extremely important foundation for Module 15. Module 15 is multiple linear regression. And here, where you can see I have only one independent variable, module 15 expands this to as many independent variables as we like. And so if you struggle with module 14, Module 15 is going to be a challenge for you because then there's other things that are going to come into that discussion. So if you're going to be doing multiple linear regression, make sure you have a good understanding of simple linear regression because simple linear regression is really a special case of a multiple regression. Okay, I've gone on long enough. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this was a helpful introduction. Let's get into a few practice problems. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye.